and welcome everybody to this week's Maternity and Midwifery Hour. It's now Series 12 and Session 7 and I'm delighted to be with you this evening. My name's Sue MacDonald. I'm the curator for the Maternity and Midwifery Festivals and also the Maternity and Midwifery Hour and it's my pleasure to be chairing the session this evening um, with the lovely Dr Elaine Moore who's with us now. And because we always do this, we're very predictable here. We always do this to our guests. We ask them to share a moment of the week. So in a minute, you'll see Elaine. Say, oh, there she is. Hello, Elaine. Um, we'll just ask Elaine to share her moment of the week with us. Um, my moment of the week is that my small dog, uh, five-year-old Bichon Frizi, actually had a meal of dog food today and ate his breakfast and his dinner. And if anyone ever has got a small dog or knows of a small dog who's a really fussy eater, will know what a big win that is. It's a huge win. <laughs> I love that. So what's going to happen tomorrow? He's still going to be eating dog food. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, so I mean, I've cooked. He's actually cooked meals for him for a good few years now. Um, so I've actually been able to get him to eat something that I can just take out of tins. Great. <laughs> oh, it won't last, Elaine. It won't last. <laughs> <laughs> Having had a fussy cat or two, oh yeah, I, that's what I say. <laughs> they have us firmly under this thing. <laughs> yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Elaine. Now, we're going to hear from Elaine in a few moments. But as ever, I'm going to welcome our new viewers or our new participants. I know we've got some of our old friends, as always, but we'll have some new people. And for those of you new people, just to let you know where we came from, where we were born. We were born at the beginning of the pandemic lockdown in 2020, four years ago now. It seems incredible that we've been going that long because we started because obviously when we were all locked down, apart from the clinical work, we weren't allowed to have study days or conferences or festivals or anything like that. And we knew that midwives and student midwives and, and uh, aspiring student midwives really needed some sort of connection. So we started the maternity hour. Mainly initially, we had a lot of stuff on COVID and what services were doing for women and families during the COVID time and how they were coping. And we did a lot of things about self-care. So if you're interested in that sort of information, it's still there in a huge file and you can access it because it's looked after by the lovely Matflix. So everything we do, just like the festivals, if you ever come to the festivals that we do, everything's recorded so you never miss a thing and it's all kept by Matflix so you can go into Matflix um, on the website you can search and find all sorts of delicious things that are fantastic for revalidation if you want to do a dissertation a few projects a few ass assignments if you're a student midwife the information is there and is all free to access. And if you're lucky enough to be in a hospital trust or a university that's subscribed, you can even get the box sets, which are even more focused, um, which give you, because they're curated by the lovely Dr. Jenny Hall, it gives you a little bit extra focus on different topics, plus some little reflective activities and additional resources. So that can be really useful. So, do access these things if you can. It's all free, except if you you know if you're requiring a subscription. But that if you're as I said, if you're lucky, your university or your trust have got that, and so it means there's no cost to you. But generally, you can just access it all. And we love you to share. We love you to share, and I hope you're going to share this evening's session with your colleagues and your friends. Um, and you can do things like have a sort of uh, a watch party, maybe in a quiet time. And I say that with a little bit of tongue in my cheek because we don't often have quiet night times in the maternity unit. But if you did have a quiet time or you had a, a, you know, a, a day off with your colleagues and you wanted to talk midwifery, because I know when midwives get together, what do we talk about midwifery? It's a really good way of, of, of starting a discussion and updating yourself at the same time. And as someone who also had to do a revalidation, it can be really, really useful because it's a very accessible way to update. Now, I'm also now going to move on to say a big thank you to everybody 
And you know, regular people will know I do this every week, but I really do mean it because I know the maternity services are stretched. Everyone's working their socks off trying to provide excellent care for mothers and babies and families. And you're doing a fab job and just keep on doing what you're doing. But look after yourselves at the same time, because I know while you're looking after other people, sometimes you don't look after yourself so well. So just have that in mind. See, now, one of the things I have to help me keep focused is the wonderful Action for Happiness calendar. And you have this on your resources. Now, this is February and we're actually coming to the end of February. But today, each day it gives you something to do and something to kind of be mindful about and, and remind you you can do little things that make you feel you feel better and other people feel better. And today's little idea is give positive comments to as many people as possible today. OK. And tomorrow, I'm going to give you tomorrow's because it's the last day of February, and that is 29th, acknowledge someone's problem or pain rather than trying to fix it. Do you know that's a really good one? Because we as midwives, we're very practical and we do love to fix things. But sometimes just being with someone, which is what midwifery is all about, and acknowledging them is really important. So have a look at these. They're fantastic. I really find them useful. Yeah. I'll get off my soapbox now. And also now I'm slipping almost imperceptibly into the news. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world and I'm I'm really focused much more about midwifery and maternity. And I know that on days of the week, we always have an international day. Now, the 1st of March, which is uh, Friday, is Zero, Zero Discrimination Day, and that's for UN AIDS. The 5th of March, which is next week, which I think is really important, is an international day for disarmament and non-proliferation awareness. And isn't that important at a time like this when the whole world feels as though it's going a bit mad, quite a bit mad. Now, the other thing is I've got a Twitter, a tweeter, a tweeter of the week is Faiza Rahan's Twitter. Now, we've had Faiza on the on the hour before um, talking about her project. And she does this sort of walk and meet with mums in her area. And she's done some fantastic tweets. She's got some really good tweets this week about inequalities in maternity care, which is so important to us as midwives. And she's got women and midwives talking to camera about their stories. And it's really, really good. So if you just want to have a, a quick tweet, and I'm not calling that X, it's staying tweeter for me. So that's well done, Phaser, I'd say. Okay, also, and this is from our lovely speaker, Elaine, there's um, an NIHR funded stepping stone study. And this is evaluating models of care with best practice and care pathways for women who are dependent on drugs and their infants and their infants from preconception to 18 months postnatal. And there's two online webinars on the 13th and 14th of March. And the link is on your resources page. So do have a look at that. There's lots of lovely reading material for you. It's not required reading, but we often put things there that, you know, there's a little combination of things. You don't read everything. It's not like a university kind of uh, course, but you might see things there that are really useful. And I think Elaine might tempt you to a few of the resources that are included there. And so without further ado, I'm really excited about this. We have just one speaker this evening and you'll know that regular viewers will know we sometimes do have one sometimes we have two sometimes we have three but today we've got elaine because we got her and she's <laughs> going to be talking about research and all the work she's been doing now some many of you will know dr elaine moore and she's sharing at her work looking at caring for pregnant women with substance dependency hence the the link i was just talking about now she's a retired midwife and we're having chat before once a midwife always a midwife you never lose that and she's, she says she's retired, but I think she's thinking midwifery all the time. She's had over 40 years of experience in the NHS in Scotland. She's had a wide and varied career as a midwife and midwife manager, both in hospital and community settings. She is passionate, and you'll see this, is passionate about improving maternity services for women and pregnant people, reducing health inequalities and midwifery-led continuity of care. And those are all close to all of our hearts, I'm sure. 
Now, prior to retirement, she commenced a pro professional doctorate with the University of the West of Scotland and graduated in November 2023. I think she's also addicted, I think, to studying. Just I just get that feeling. Now, her study explored safeguarding midwives' experiences of caring for pregnant women with substance dependency and their families. And this included how midwifery-led continuity care assisted midwives in building and maintaining relationships with women as well as members of the multidisciplinary multi-agency team. So I'm delighted to welcome Elaine to us. Thank you so much for coming along this evening. The screen is now yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, um, for that lovely introduction. Yes, I hope everybody can see that now. Um, um, just to say again, thanks very much for the introduction, Sue, and thank you to the Maternity and Midwifery Forum for the opportunity to share uh, my research uh, tonight. Um, as I say, it's looking at safeguarding midwives' experiences of caring um, for pregnant women with substance dependency. And it's exploring um, really a, a relationship building and how they built relationships and how they managed to maintain those relationships. For ease in the presentation, um, I'm going to use midwives to designate safeguarding midwives and women when I'm talking about pregnant women with substance dependency, because it is a mouthful, and the number of times I say it, it probably would be here for about an hour. So, why did I, I decide to um, look at this? And, it, and I think the thing is, is, when you're going to dedicate a large part of your life to something, you really have to have a particular area of interest in it, because sometimes by the end of it, you will hate it with a passion. However, um, this is something that was a real um, area of professional and, and personal interest um, because of some of the things that happened in, in my younger years. Um, mm -hmm. When I started looking into it, there's lots of research there about um, women's views on maternity services and midwifery care. But there's less research exploring how midwives experience caring for these women. And the research that is there tends to look more um, at midwives in a hospital setting or in a clinic setting. Um, and very few of them actually were midwives who were involved in caring for women in a continuity of care model. And when I looked at it, there was just no research to date um, exploring how these midwives um, maintain relationships with women in a midwifery-led continuity of care where they are the main um, professional for the women. So what was my study aim? My study aim was to explore how safeguarding midwives provided care and in particular, like I say, around about the relationships. Um, how did they build the relationships and how did they maintain those relationships? Um, when you actually look at it, there's many differences in the job descriptions of safeguarding midwives. If you spoke to a lot of safeguarding midwives across the UK, their roles and um, their uh, jobs would be completely different. Um, some of them are safeguarding midwives but have a solely advisory role, whereas other midwives, like the midwives in my study, actually provided care um, to the women, hands-on um, mid midwifery care. Um, they had, there was five safeguarding midwives who took part in the semi-structured semi interviews and we did use what we call a visual in inquiry technique. And that really was just picture cards. Uh, so it was cards of different pictures that the midwives could choose if they became unstuck when they were trying to describe something. Um, all of the midwives were NMC registered, of course, and were qualified for 14 to, to 31 years. So there was a wide range of experience there. Um, they cared for the women um, in, a, in a mixed case load. So there was mixed vulnerability. It wasn't solely substance dependency. However, the focus that I wanted was, was um, with substance dependent women. And most of the maternity care was actually provided um, within the women's home. And th that was an important aspect, and it's something that will be discussed later on in, in, in the presentation, um, about the importance of place of care um, when it comes to building relationships. 
Um, not only did they do that, but they also accompanied women to the obstetric clinics, addiction clinics, and social work meetings and child protection meetings. So they really were uh, uh, that woman's advocate um, for her throughout her care. All of the midwives had demonstrated an interest in caring for women with vulnerabilities um, before joining the team. Um, and it was about caring for women with vulnerabilities, not child protection. So there's a definite difference there, um, although they had an interest in that. Um, and you'll see the next slide while I put that on is because three of the midwives had attained a postgraduate diploma in child protection. Um, so that was an important facet of their education and their knowledge. So when you start off with this, you start off with questions. And see, it can start off, you know, it's, you've got one question and then when you actually sit and think about it, it's about, well, what builds that question? And that's where you come in with your aims. So as you can see, the, the research questions were very much around about relationships. And it was all about, you know, what was their lived experience? What was the nature of that experience? And what was the nature of the relationship? Um, did the midwives have any personal or professional qualities that were different that actually helped them with an interaction? And then did they have any other experience or knowledge that, that helped them facilitate a supportive relationship? And one of the big questions for me, um, which is the only got one aim, was is that did this relationship with the women then change how they interacted with the wider multidisciplinary, multi-agency team? Um, and you'll see that later on, my answer to that would be yes. Um, and you'll see why I answered yes to that already later on. So the reason that I've brought this slide up is, is then to kind of discuss my methodology, because I always think that that's important with researchers, is to actually understand a wee bit about what the underpinning is in it. So I used a relatively new study methodology, which is called interpretative phenomenological analysis. And that first came to light in 1996 by Jonathan Smith. However, it is now quite a recognised um, methodology um, in qualitative research. Its roots are in psychology um, and its foundations are in phenomenology, hermeneutics and ideography. Um, and it's based on several philosophies and philosophers. So there's lots of different theories in this. And this is what I really liked about it, because I'm not a great believer in one size fits all. I think that sometimes blended approaches to things actually bring about a better knowledge base and a better understanding of what's happening. Um, and it focuses in the particular of a participant's experience of phenomena. So in that way, it's what they call ide ideographic. So you're looking at a particular experience from a particular part participant in a particular context. So it can get right down to, if you like, the nitty gritty of what's actually happening. This is a really good slide that I like, and it's from Charlie Ketal in a, in a paper, and the references are at the end of the, the presentation as well. And it actually shows you how all the different philosophies and philosophers' theories come together um, to make this blended approach. But one of the things that I felt was really important was, as a midwife for 30 years, I could not take my knowledge out of that research. I couldn't do it. I, I, I'm not a great believer in Husserl's bracketing because how can I bracket something? Because if I've experienced it, I was a midwife, I was a community midwife, I've cared for women with substance dependency. So how could I take that knowledge out of that? What IPA actually does is, is it takes cognizance of that researcher's experience and you build it into your discussion during your research and your, your findings. So you take cognizance of that and you build it in, but you always come back to what your participants telling you. So it's quite robust in that way. Um, I'll show you this in the next minute. And I do make a wee bit of an apology for this because it is quite a, a, about analysis. But I do think, again, analysis is, is important. And it's about understanding how robust this um, uh, methodology actually is. Um, because qualitative research can be, be, can be criticised for its lack of rigour. 
But when you actually sit and look at this, um, you can see through it just how rigorous this process is. So in IPA, when you start off, you're starting off with your interview. So you're doing a slight bit of analysis when you're doing your interview because you're thinking about it's an interaction, you know, with your participant. The other thing as well is, is that then you're listening to your transcript, you know, you're listening to your audio as you're transcribing. So again, you're getting a wee bit more understanding there of what's happening. And then the real analysis starts and it's about reading and rereading. And when you're reading and rereading, for the first two um, readings, I actually listened to the transcript at the same time so that I could actually understand the nuances and, and the inflections, you know, that within the conversation, which would give a greater understanding to what the midwives were trying to tell me. And then it's initial note, and now I must admit, it's just step one, step two, but I tended to do those those two things together because I would make wee notes, you know, um, about you know what, what was important, what was coming out the page at me, um, and what did I find interesting and wanted to follow through. The next step is developing the emergent themes. So you're looking at it, you're looking at it conceptually, linguistically, and descriptively. So you're actually looking at the three different prongs of how we communicate. Um, but one of the other things that I did as well, though, as is being honest, is, is I also made notes around about um, body language and nonverbal. So there were things in that too. So I was bringing all that together. And then what we did is, is I was searching for connections across these emergent themes. Now, for each of the um, transcripts, I maybe would have about 30 emergent themes. And then what I would do is, is I would stop with that. And then what you then do is, is you move on to the next case. You can't forget what you've learned with your first case, but you must set it aside because you want to look at your next participant's experience, their ideographic experience, not your idea of what their ideographic experience is. And then you you bring you do all that you come to emergent themes and then you start bringing together all the information you have and you're looking for patterns across the case the the, the cases. What you then are left with is is five which in the old parlance is called superordinate themes. Um, Smith Flowers and Larkin actually wrote a new uh, book in 2022, and it and the new um wording that they use is group experiential themes which I feel is much better I don't really like superordinate themes because it kind of makes it feel as if they're more important than some of the other themes that underpin it however I just feel that every one of them is just as important to the other um, so the group experiential themes I think is, is, is a better way of describing it so I came up with five transformation tug of war reciprocity Proxy Parenthood and Mike Advice Twitch. And each of those names come out of the feelings and the themes that were coming up. And uh, as I go on through when I'm talking about them, I'm going to be using the midwives' actual quotes to help you understand why I come up with this idea that it was transformation, it was tug of war, uh, reciprocity or, or whatever. Super and subordinate themes, transformation, tug of war, reciprocity, prosperity, midwives, twitch are all superordinate or group experiential themes. The sub themes or personal experiential themes in new terminology um, underpin these. Uh, so you can see from them that there are different things underneath them. However, it gets a wee bit more complicated because some of the superordinate themes are actually in more than one superordinate themes. So as you can see here, um, care and compassion actually found that that was present in four. Mutuality was present in three. Midwife reflection and reflexivity was present in two. So you can see how it all interlinks and merges together to make this experience. So, I'll start off with superordinate theme one, which is transformation. Now, you can see here that there's the, the, the two sets of midwife quotes, and there was a distinct difference in how women uh, midwives perceived women 
from before they joined the team to after they joined the team. Um, and that change was what I would call transformational. And Gary Katandon actually speaks about the difference between changing something and transforming something. And what she intimates is, is that change is normally for the outside in. Um, it's in response to outside influences. It can be small and incremental, and normally there's not an awful lot of effort in the part of the person when they're undertaking it. So I would say that that's like you get a new guideline and you undertake and you use the new guideline, but you're not really thinking too much about it. You're changing your practice, but there's not an awful lot of effort in that, is there? Um, but the thing with transformation is, is a lot of the time is from the inside out and it begins with a question or a purpose. So you're really sometimes questioning what you're doing, you're questioning the purpose of what you're doing. Um, and it, it can be an internal fundamental change of your beliefs and that can be quite challenging and normally requires quite a bit of effort to achieve that transformation. So you can see here that there was, you know, quite a bit of a change. So how did that happen? Well, that happens through midwife reflection and reflexivity. And you can see here that Cameron, when they're talking about it, you know, it, it can be slow, but in some cases it's an epiphany. And for Cameron, this was an epiphany because it was about, you know what? See, if I had been born into that family, that addict could be me. Because if I had to put up with what this young girl had to put up with and then listening to her actually tell her story and tell her, tell her story how drugs helped her cope with that made a huge difference to her. Um, and it was something that came up um, quite a lot through through the, the study um, was how about this, this transforma transformation that the midwives went through. Um, it was really, really important. And all the midwives actually you know, it gave an instance like this. This was just one of the most powerful ones, I felt. I know, can I just say, although some of the midwives' names are male, um, it, there were no men, it, there were no male midwives. It was all um, female. And the thing with that is, is that they picked their own pseudonyms, some of them. So at the end of the day, <laughs> uh, so that was why. Um, the, the, the names are maybe seem a bit unusual, but no, we didn't have a higher ratio of male midwives um, than others. So the, another part of transformation is um, time, the importance of time, and that's a huge thing for midwives. Midwives felt all at the time when they were maybe working in the community, they didn't have uh, the time to be able to um, connect with women because when they were in a clinic situation, you know, they had 10, 15 minutes per woman, something happened, they did, you know, so they were always aware that there was other people sitting in, in the, the, the waiting room. Um, so a big thing about it was the, the um, working environment. You know, we all understand that when you're working in clinics or you're working in hospitals, you get competing demands in your time, you know, and it can be really, really difficult to actually be able to just sit and talk to somebody and find out, you know, what's really bothering you? What is going on with you? Um, and the thing is, is that it's this thing as well about um, they, they really appreciated the ability to work autonomously, to manage their own diary and to be able to give the women that they perceived needed more time, more time. And that's what built the relationships. The next one is tug of war. Um, a superordinate theme and this came about there was two aspects of it one was with maternity services and the other one was um, social work now maternity services it was more along the lines of relationships or lack of them seemed to be integral to how um, the midwives worked alongside the midwives in the hospital and how the midwives in the hospital sometimes perceived the women that they were um, given over to their care and another big thing for them was is that they didn't appear to know what the safeguarding team was about um, and, and just how difficult their role could actually be. Uh, so I think that that caused friction and, and a bit of tug of war around about, you know, well, I, know, I do know these women, I know what's best, you know, because I understand where they're coming from. And maybe if you understood a bit more, you, you would be able to take care for them. Um, and, and a more appropriate way. I'll not say a better way, but in a more appropriate way. 
But the big area of friction um, was when there's competing multi-agency philosophies and priorities. And you could always say that, OK, this in this case, this was um, between social work and the midwives caring for the women. Um, but you could also put it to anybody, you know, if you look at obstetrics and midwifery, we've got completely different philosophies, it's a bit contentious, but we do have different philosophies around about our care, so that can cause friction. Although we work together well, most of the time it can cause difficulties. Um, so for the so for the midwives, they felt that the social worker's main focus was in child protection. Um, and although the midwife's focus was on um, child protection and keeping that um, child well and safe, they felt that the way to do that was through protecting the mother and keeping the mother safe and well. So they would always advocate for the mother. Um, and sometimes it was about trying to get social work to see that a well mum is a well baby. So how can we support that? The other thing as well is, is that would, they would advocate really strongly for women when they felt that um, women were being treated unfairly. And in particular, one of the midwives was saying around about, you know, how some of these young women, because of the cyclical nature of poverty and addiction, were already known to social work. So they were kind of written off before they even got to the point of um, you know, like child protection assessments and things, and they would advocate very strongly for these women um, when the need came. So reciprocity, and this was one of the ones that actually underpins a lot of the relationship building. Um, and, and for them, midwifery continuity was absolutely fundamental to relationship-based care um, and how this reciprocity was built up. Seeing me, seeing you, Probably quite a strange one, but some of the midwives had actually um, had some challenges, you know, growing up. And you can see here one of the midwives says that, you know, it's how I was brought up. I can know um, to a degree what these women are going through. But the other thing is, is that aspect of being able to see um, aspects of themselves, of their life circumstances and the women that they care for. And then there was the knowing me, knowing you. And this was a, a big thing as well, was because you're really getting to know them. And that comes back to midwifery continuity and having the time to sit and actually listen to the women and see what is their life story? You know, what is, how can I help you? Um, and how can I make this journey easier for you? One of the other things was normalised, not stigmatised. And this was actually, the, the interviews were in 2019. And this was when we were looking at the best start in Scotland, which was a lot around about midwifery continuity. Um, and it was felt that best start would allow the kind of normalisation for the women who maybe were or on um, substitute um, programmes such as methadone, where they were stable, they were well. Um, so if they were in and what they would see as normal antenatal clinics or being cared for in, in a midwifery-led continuity care model, but within a, a lower risk caseload, then maybe that, that would help normalise um, uh, the, the situation that they were in and make the mums feel more normalised. The other thing was mutuality. And this was about, you know, um, not doing board but doing with um, and it's about empowering decision making so it's not about taking the control from the women and saying you need to do this or you need to do that it's about actually well look see if I can appoint you in the right direction you know if you make these steps maybe it, you can make that difference yourself and midwives believe that by doing that then the, the those changes would be more long lasting so listening I like this quote because it says, you know, they might be just talking absolute nonsense, but it's really important because for some of these women, nobody listens to them. Nobody, you know, they go into their GP or they go into their, their um, and they just think, oh, here she comes again. Um, but the thing is, is let's say it might not be important to you, but it's important to them. And they felt being able to listen to the women um, made a huge difference. And walking the tightrope, this goes back to the transformation, what I said earlier about transformation, no being easy. 
because we all have beliefs and attitudes um, and a lot of them are ingrained um, and you do try not to judge people but you can't help being human yourself and sometimes you will and that's normal um, but it's about how you then reflect on that and then move forward. A lot of these women, and in particular in the midwives we're talking about this, they are involved in criminal activity. And, it, you know, it can be difficult for the midwives, you know, who have got a moral compass who that is different to actually be able to do that. So sometimes they, they might not like what they do, but they like them and they will care for them, you know, care for them, um, 100% genuinely care for them, as one of my advice says later on. And then balancing relationships, and it's balancing relationships um, around about, uh, you know, making sure that you're not building reliance. Because what you're trying to do is, is build empowerment and um, self-reliance. Um, so it's walking that tightrope and you know like kind of that balancing thing about making sure you're not being too much of one and not enough of the other this was huge the power of the mid, the women's narrative listening to women's story is the most influential thing that these midwives told every time they would come back to it you know um, and understanding that um, it's life circumstances that bring people to addiction Um it's not just they've woke up one day and they decide, you know what, I'm just going to start using heroin. So proxy parenthood. Proxy parenthood come in through actually looking at the linguistic patterns within the text. Um, and it was demonstrated uh, through some of the words that they use, things like protection, care, compassion, nurturing, support, guidance, lots of the things that the, you would... You would, you know, if you spoke a parent, you would think that well, that's what being a parent is, and it was this vicarious um, parenting was actually high, highlighted in a study of psychologists who were care, caring for um, uh, children with adverse childhood events, and what they were actually doing is is that they were kind of they started to find themselves parenting the children, but they also then started to find themselves parenting the parents, so that the parents would then parent the children in a way that they felt was appropriate. So that was where this kind of came from. And they kind of spoke along the same way, using much the same language. It was more common um, when the midwives were speaking about young women who they felt had um, limited uh, maternal or uh, paternal support. So sometimes kids who were in care and, and things like that, they would feel quite maternal towards them and would demonstrate that. And then the next thing was courageous conversations. And this is about sometimes about boundary setting as well. You know, as a parent, you, you, you set the boundaries of what you expect that relationship to be. And the midwives definitely did that with, with these women. They would set out the parameters about what their expectations were. Um, but the big thing around about it is, is that... Um, even if the, the women moved away from that, they never gave up on them. They never gave up on them, and this will come up later on. Courageous actions. Again, midwives will go into places that other midwives, no, not other midwives, but other professionals won't go. Um, and a lot of the time, the because the care's in the home, they're doing first visits, and they're doing booking visits, and they're doing them in the home. And like I said before, there can be criminality around about that. Um, and if the guys have been involved or the partners have been involved in um, criminal activity and criminal justice is involved, sometimes things can be challenging for the midwives when they're getting into these environments. But I asked them, I said, well, why do you do it? Well, why no? They can't kind of come to me, so I've got to go to them. <laughs> um, so sometimes they're aware. When you're a community midwife, you know, there was a block of flats I knew as a community midwife that I had to watch and I always made sure I let somebody know when I was going in and I let somebody know when I was coming out. Um, know that I felt, because there's always that respect in the community there for midwives, I think. it's an, It seems to be inherent. Um, and know that I thought for one minute anything was going to happen to me, but always like just to be sure. <laughs> So the other thing as well was this tenacity and like I was saying earlier on of it, you know, sometimes things happen and midwives kind of feel that um, 
the, the parameters or the boundaries get pushed and pushed and pushed. But having said that, as is that if the women then feel that they've let the midwives down and they then start to kind of push the midwives away, these midwives will continue to search for them. Like one spent three hours looking for this young girl. The other one was saying, I mean, I think they're all Sam, these ones. And basically what she was saying is, I don't, I don't care. All I care about is these women and making sure they get the care that they need. Because, you know, they are human. And if they've had a blip, then that's fine. We're all human. I have blips all the time. So that's that's thing. And, and it's this thing again about no walking away. And what she felt is, is that once the women realised that they weren't walking away from them, that trust was being built up and that was absolutely huge. Um, and the midwives really felt that that was important. Care and compassion. You can see the thing is, is you know, I genuinely 100% care about the outcome. You know, you don't switch off or just constantly think about them. And that's important. But then that brings into the next part about safeguarding midwives and their emotion work and the fact that we're going to be looking towards um, trauma-informed maternity services. You know, to be able to um, support the women, we have to support the midwives and we have to ensure that the midwives have um, the support that they need. And I think that the kind of support we should be looking at is like clinical supervision, such like the Family Nurse Partnership have, you know, in particular for specialist midwives who... Sometimes when you're listening, if you you know listen to what Cameron was saying, it these are really traumatic stories they're listening to. Um, so we have to make sure that the midwives are looked after and, and that they're kept as well as they can be. Now, this is our whistle stop um, around about knowledge formation and ways of knowing in midwifery. And this is about the midwives twitch. Now, this alone um, was just under 10,000 words in my thesis. So it's a huge part, but it's theory driven. And I'm just going to give a total whistle stop to a, an, an, an example at the end of it um, as to why I think that it's important. So um, when I was looking at it, I couldn't actually find anything along the lines in mid midwifery. There was some midwifery um, articles and literature around about how midwives learn and how midwives know. But this, to me, resonated. So see for the bit about nursing, you just put in the word mid midwife and we'll be fine. But I couldn't put the word midwife in because obviously that's not what Carper spoke about. So Carper back in 1978 spoke about how the four patterns of knowing and nursing. Um, but so we talk about empirics, which is basically your academic learning, which is, is your midwifery theory. And then you get your aesthetics. So that's really, as I would say, the art of midwifery. So it's where you're using that scientific knowledge when you're caring for your women. Personal knowledge, that's all the different things that we have. Now, personal knowledge covers a wide range of subjects, but it's about how you use that along with the other two um, and, and use the confidence to act accordingly. And you need confidence to be able to do that. And then ethics, which is the moral com moral component. But as we all know, that can be difficult to define. But we all have a kind of moral compass that we use. These four fundamental patterns were then enhanced by unknowing by Mun Hall, which basically says that I'm quite happy to tell you I don't know what I don't know. Um, and sometimes that can be hard for professionals to actually admit, I'm sorry, I don't know, uh, but I'll find out. Um, and the worst thing you can actually do is no know and then just try and bluff it. Um, and then the social political knowing um, by White in 1995. And that's really important for midwives and how that underpins, because it's really about, you know, inequalities in health and how patient and women's well-being um, affects uh, the, the, how their babies are and how they are. So what was the midwives twitch? What it is, is an intuitive use of all the knowledge that we have. And it's it's what I identified was a mechanism called phrenesis. It's sometimes described as practical wisdom, but it's actually just an amalgam. The best way to describe it is it's just an amalgamation of all the knowledge that we have. Everything that um, Carper, Munhall and White talk about. And then it's this using it in a moral way for the best interests of the people that we're caring for. And basically it's a gut feeling. Now, I do not know a midwife in this planet that hasn't had a gut feeling about something. 
I don't, I don't know that. I just don't know what's going on here, but I know something's going on. So this actually has two aspects of it. It shows you how the midwife uses all the knowledge that they have to actually basically get a case overturned. It was going one way, and then she just happened to make a particular sentence because of how this man made her feel. But the other thing around about it is, is it's about continuity of care because we know continuity of care builds and supports relationships with women, but it actually supports and builds relationships with the wider team because they're in a particular area, a particular geographical area. All these people in this child protection meeting knew one another. So they knew when this particular midwife says, there's just something. But the other thing as well is because that midwife knew everybody round about there, she felt safe to say, this is a gut feeling I've got. So that's relatively new as far as midwifery continuity of care goes. We know that. So this is a thing around about, well, actually, it supports the, that relationship, so therefore supports safety. Next, so what? I always say, you know, we all do this and then it's so what? And really, there's no surprise in any of that um, when you see what the, the, the presentation has been before. Um, and then the other thing as well is, is that you do this and then you think you're going to answer things. And then what actually happens is, is that you end up with more questions than answers. And that's my research that I think should happen. Now, there's a couple of bits in here that I think the stepping stones will be really, really helpful in answering. And that's the first one about um, women's experiences of being cared for in this, um, you know, midwifery-led continuity of care model. And the other thing is around about the place, you know, how, how does the place of care affect that? Um, and then, like I say, my big thing is, is that I always feel that when we're looking at models of care, we always focus on medical outcomes, we always focus on clinical outcomes, and I feel we should be looking at psychological and social outcomes as well. So basically, that's me. So thank you to the midwives who took part in my research because they were very candid, they were very open, which is not easy. And thank, thank you so much for listening. And I think I've managed to do that in no bad time. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've done it in brilliant time, Elaine. It, I mean, it's um, it's always difficult, isn't it? Because that's been your life and everything for, for so long to c kind of condense something into I mean, there's so many other things you could be saying as well, isn't there? I, yeah. I know that. <laughs> But thank you so much for, for that presentation. And I have to say, I can feel the strength and commitment of those wonderful midwives yes. in all the words they were saying. It was lovely because mm -hmm. that really comes so through so strongly yes. with their tenacity and, and, and their commitment to what they're doing for, with women and, and families. Fantastic. And I love the midwife twitch because that really does sum up your so many things about you, you can't mm. put into words necessarily but you know it's there mm. so thank you for that now we do have a few questions now any of you've got some questions you're going to be have to be quick not got long as you know but we have we do have a query i'm not sure if this is um a tricky one elaine oh, yeah. but this, <laughs> this is carlene oliver hello carlene and Carlene says, funnily enough, I'm currently writing my dissertation on alcohol use during pregnancy based on socioeconomic status. Can anyone point me in the right direction of any interesting reads? Thank you in advance. Now, Elaine. Any um, clues? I can only think off the top of my head, being honest. Okay. Um, because obviously... My research was a lot around about, um, you know, the, the midwife's perception of of uh, caring for women with substance use rather than actual substance use itself. Um, I will have, I mean, is there any way of sharing it, at, you know, like if I troll and find things? Because I, I know I do have some things around about yeah. addiction in women, but not solely alcohol. Um, I'm afraid. 
I mean, I guess there's something to be said for looking in um, NICE or SIGN guidelines mm -hmm. um, because that can be a good starting point because often the evidence, there is evidence there, mm -hmm. I guess, that you could start. I mean, I think what's exciting, I'll say, when you're doing a dissertation is when you start off with this sort of question you have, which, mm -hmm. Elaine, you put beautifully with mm -hmm. having all these questions you have to set, Um when you start searching and thinking about it, you go wide out mm -hmm. and you have to be a bit careful of that, Carleen, because you could involve, you could end up doing a massive project and not be able to really focus in on what you're interested in. But mm -hmm. you kind of have to do that broad reading and digging around to find the bits that you want. And I'm sure Elaine might come up with some interesting things for you. Um, mm -hmm. I, yeah. Sorry, Elaine. No, you're OK. I mean, the, the, I would say to start off with um, is looking into the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder because you'll find yes. quite a lot of the information there around about alcohol use in pregnancy. And it's this thing about finding somewhere to start so that you can then start mining the information. Because what I found is, is that um, you will throw away more articles than you will use but you always have to look at it and, and get the article because you might find one paragraph in something that is seemingly nothing to do with what you're looking at, but it's really important to how you are looking at that subject, if mm. that makes sense. That does. Because I found that um, some of this, a lot in my um, thesis, when I actually came to looking at safeguarding midwives' experiences of caring for women, there wasn't much there. You know, when I did safeguarding midwives, I got absolutely no hits. So I had to start coming into it for another way. So it was a, I had to start coming into it then as relationships. Mm. So it's maybe about turning it on its head and then looking at it as, instead of looking solely at alcohol, as I actually sitting looking at it as addictions and then start to sift through the references mm. that are on those papers because I found it, um, a few really good papers that way. Mm. It takes a lot of work. It does. And you need, I think you need a tool to assess papers as well. I don't, I'm sure Carleen, you, you, your, your university will have given you some of the tools, but I, I think the CASP qualitative yes. and quantitative um mm checklist can be really helpful in getting through asking yourself and getting into that way of thinking but thank you that was a lovely question and and Carleen also wants to know where can she can read some of your research Elaine <laughs> well at the moment there's only the one <laughs> there's there is one article on the maternity article, forum um, on the maternity <laughs> midwifery forum um however I mean I'm in the process of writing other pieces of work um, that uh, I'm getting through. Hopefully, um, it's uh, the British Journal of Midwifery is, is one of them. Um, but I'm just trying, you know, it, the thing is, is that you spend so long with us, and I, I did only graduate in November. Um, so the thing is, is that it takes quite a process to get to that point, and then you just, well, it's coming up to Christmas as well, so I just kind of left it for a little bit. <laughs> and then, I think you're allowed. Uh, and so I'm <laughs> in the process of, like you said, you know, I don't think I'll ever give up. But I'll just keep in. So there hopefully will be something coming out in the very near okay. future around about it. Well, Carleen, hang on, because if Elaine comes up with a, a couple of references, we can send them on to you. Yeah. That would be helpful. Fine. Because she's probably already shifting in her brain thinking about these things. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, actually... I'm getting that thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's fabulous. Thank you. And thank you for starting us off that so nicely. And we've got Juliet Samuel, who's a, a regular with us. Hi, Juliet. And she says the repris... Oh, I'm going to have problems with this word. The reprisosity, reprosity <laughs> you mentioned sounded great. However, was there mitigation in terms of safeguarding unintentional bias due to the history of midwives personal experience on the provision of care that's an interesting one mm -hmm. um i think the thing is is that with ipa as i said you know you're actually taking into consideration 
all the different aspects mm. of what your participants are telling you. So then me have been, I mean, I'm wondering if you've been biased as in why they decided to become safeguarding midwives or mm. bias in the fact that they treated the women differently because they had some um, previous experience and did see themselves through it. Um, I, I really, that is a quite a difficult question to answer because I can't answer for the midwives, if you know what I mean. Mm. All I can say is, is that I would suspect that, that I was some influence from mm. their past which made them want to care mm. um, for women. and But not all the midwives had a history of, of, of different, um, you know, of, of challenges. Um, I don't think they treated the women differently because of that. But I think mm. they understood the women because mm. of that and it gave them an understanding of what they might be going through and this mm. empathy mm. around about it. Um, so uh, does that answer the question? I think that that gets us started nicely. Thank you, Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've got Lauren, 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 who says, do you know which hospital trusts a, con a continuity of care a team for women experience substance dependency? I only know of the one um, in the area that I am in, <clears throat> or, or yeah. I should say in, in the locality. There are not many. Um, yeah. And that's part of what Stepping Stones is about. It's about mm. mapping um, what provision is there for the women um, and looking at what works best for the women. Now, I personally believe that that's the best way to work for the women. I think at the end of the day, midwifery continuity um, is... Um, um, the midwives, though, in, in this study were quite clear that intrapartum care was not where they felt that continuity was best served. They felt that the, it was more to do with antenatal and postnatal, mm. advocating for women, supporting them, and basically doing that early intervention work for them. You know, or with them, sorry. Um, so I'm not sure where else has replicated that model, although I do know that when the model was first set up, that there were several inquiries from other health boards throughout oh. the UK and um, oh. with an interest in it, but I don't know how many there is. Step and Stones will certainly give us an idea. So, Lauren... Find that link and get into yeah. that work that uh, yeah. workshop. It'd be really useful to find that sort of level of information. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Okay, we're on to Nina now, who's saying, um, "Thank you so much. I'd love to know this research. Would it be possible be able to be shared anywhere? I'd love to have this in my references for university." <laughs> I think I think Elaine. I think we're just twisting Elaine's arm. Mm -hmm. she's, she has only she's freshly minted from <laughs> November and it's quite a big thing um, to finish a PhD or your uh, doctorate, mm -hmm. which a professional doctorate or whatever, and then start publishing thing. It's quite a bit, quite a long winded, quite a, when you can see the work. Mm -hmm. So you'll have to watch this space. Have a look at the Maternity and Midwifery Forum mm -hmm. publication that came out, I think, last week, wasn't it, Elaine? Yeah. Um, it was last week it came out. So yeah, and just and just it's keep. Cool. And you might want to just link. Are you on Twitter, Elaine? I am, but I don't use it for anyone. Oh, okay. So you can't tweet. No. Okay, you you'll just that. have to keep keep an eye, Nina. What it is is, I think, really being honest, it, it's difficult to kind of like you like blow your own trumpet. I think yeah. that kind of thing around about well, maybe I need to get a bit better at that. I think so. This is an important piece of work. Okay, so we've got then Georgia Louise Daly. Hi, Georgia. Now, this is good. I'm right now writing my dissertation. My topic is, what are the barriers of care around the experience of women who misuse substances? Do you know any good articles that would relate to my question? Thank you. Barriers. Oh, goodness, Georgia. Yes. Absolutely. I've got, well, no hundreds, but I've got a lot. Because there's a lot, like I say, that there is a lot of research actually around about um, midwives, uh, midwives, sorry, women's um, care and, and their perceptions of care and barriers is a huge thing. 
Um, and and it's simple barriers. It's like um, you know, the clinics three miles away or whatever, and they kind of get there. I'll, I'll give you an example. We're lo one of your local hotspots, if you like, for um drug use. And um, the buses stop at um at, at six o'clock at night. So we, you know, trying to run things like antenatal education classes, which are local to the the, the community. And um, the other thing as well is is like trying to um sometimes you know like have clinics because the the people that worked in the area had to work outside the area a lot of the time they were only home, you oh. know. And and although there is the provision in law for people to women to attend um, antenatal clinics. Employers don't always let women away. Mm. Women sure. don't always like to, you know, like mm. force the issue because, you know, their job's at risk. So mm. there's loads of different things within that. But barriers, absolutely. You know, there's the, the, the stigma around about it, how women are treated sometimes when they attend, if you like, antenatal clinics. I'll, even the women that come, you know, like to the obstetric clinics and they have their midwife with them can sometimes feel it's really difficult to do that because they're sitting with what they see as normal women, but because they've got um, a special midwife with them, then at the end of the day, they can feel stigmatised about it. So, yes, I have loads there. Well, we might be able to liberate a few from you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and share them share them on the on the um, forum. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. That was wonderful, Elaine. And now we're on to um oh gosh, Nina says, amazing. Uh amazing final question. Thank you, Nina. She <laughs> says, What alternatives would you consider to a patient that has substance misuse? Now, do, I'm 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 assuming that's the methadone and the heroin methadone. issue. Yeah, well, and and this is another thing from stepping stones that yeah. they're actually looking at is they're actually looking as well as at treatment programs. Okay. So you have methadone, but you also have this is you, this is the same for me with your reciprocity, both <laughs> which okay. is, is used a lot in America. Um, rather than here, we tend to use methadone, basically, in my view, because it's cheap. Um, and it does do the job. Um, so the thing is, is that it all depends on the woman and what the woman wants to do. There used to be this big thing around about um, maintenance, and we had to keep main maintenance, no matter what. Um, but that can be difficult. In pregnancy, women's demands, you know, like actual biological demands for mm. methadone goes up. So what you don't want to be doing in a way is reducing the methadone um, mm. for the good of the baby um, when it's maybe going to actually make a woman then go and try and um, get drugs from outside, you know, like street mm. drugs, because that, they don't know what they're taking. But it's at least mm. if they have, um, a, they're on a methadone programme and you in, increase the dose, then you're still keeping them stable. So mm. Mm, I just, I, I think it's all down to having a, conver a conversation with the woman, with addiction services um, and with um, the, the, the obst obst obstetricians. Um, but having said that, a lot of, because this was like a midwifery led um, programme and because the midwife was always with the woman, you know, like when she was going to like her addiction um, services, the, the decisions tended to be made there. Mm. Um, I think the whole thing is, is that I, I don't have a big view of methadone versus mm. rape and offering. I think that there is there are pros and cons to both. Um, I do think that for women to actually reduce to the point that they can come off a, a substitute um, is a bit, um, how can I put it, challenging. Mm. Um, and I don't know that it would be, it makes that much difference yeah. safety-wise to the baby. Yeah. Because being honest, withdrawal from methadone for babies doesn't tend to be as severe and it's been shown clinically that it's not as severe as the likes of heroin or cocaine or yeah. one of the worst diazepam believe it or not yeah yeah absolutely 
No, that's fantastic. Now, we've well, we've come to the end, and I always say this is the quickest we- hour in the week, and it really is. It is. And, <laughs> and I want to say a huge thank you to Elaine. Now, this is going. We're going to have to twist Elaine's arm to get her writing away over the next few weeks, months, and the year. And she will be coming to the Edinburgh Festival in November. Yes. And so there'll be more of this story later, which would be fantastic. So in the meantime, so thank you hugely to Elaine. I'm going to say thank you to Angela, who's behind the scenes making sure this is all <laughs> recorded beautifully, and to Paul, who's been feeding me the questions. I should have said, that's why I keep looking away. It's not I'm looking away from you. I have to go to my other screen, for I have two screens, one with the questions. So thank you to Paul for feeding those through to me and making sure all is running smoothly there. The resources will be there available and and it'll be on. Um, you have your podcast on Friday for those of you who like that. It's six o'clock in the morning for you. And it'll also this will also come around on Tuesday. But do share it with your colleagues. This is a really interesting from so many different facets not just the fantastic midwives but the fantastic midwife here in elaine but also the research methodology which was really interesting and you might want to watch that again to get the understanding because it's like it's like when you come into midwifery it's like learning and learning another language so we've been introduced to this one so uh just to say next week we have a focus on preeclampsia and eclampsia and we've got um it, preeclampsia and eclampsia in labour, birth and beyond with Leila Lavalli and Anja Johansson Bibi. Don't forget to book if you want to come to the All Ireland uh, Festival in Dublin on the 9th of April or to Birmingham on 14th of May. With the programme is very exciting. So in the meantime, I have to say good, good night. We'll see you next Wednesday, same place, same time. And in the meantime, take care of yourselves. See you soon.